need to fast based on where you are physiologically. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, as, as far as that, I mean, that was an old, uh, you know, a very old, very problematic uh, uh, experiment that is like the basis for so much of, you know, Western dietetic theory, you know, nutrition theory. But, and the thing is, you can go back to all of these theories and do that. You could just, I, and I just kind of stopped after a couple because it was like, this is insane. I don't even need to. But if you go back and you keep, you know, look at the history of all of these concepts, and, you know, the vitamin theory and cashmere funk, and you, you just study all that entire history, uh, you will see how it just gets crazier and crazier. And so that's why we say, okay, we got to start over again. And for us, it's, it's better. It's like, okay, well, let's, let's just put that other stuff over there and then let's actually focus on the experience, you know, of practicing the therapeutic mode of eating and transitioning and, you know, eating these things so that it becomes self-evident. You know, it's not about what you read or what you heard. You experience it. Um, yeah, I got two questions. Um, are you going to talk about later on? Are you going to talk about cellular waste and the uh, lymphatic system, or uh, I know you studied uh, work. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I might, might get in, I might get into that a little bit because mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a little bit more of an advanced, you know, to kind of get into that the principles of moving the lymphatic system. That's really what we're talking about. If you take it to another level, you know, air it was dealing with mucus, you know, well, what's the mucus system in the body where, you know, is there's a different, I should make this point, there's a difference between the mucus that is created ba uh, when, you, when you eat mucus forming foods and these foods sit in your gut and they turn to slime. That's different than when you blow your nose or you eat a piece of fruit and you notice a little bit of mucus comes out in your mouth. That's secretion of lymphatic fluid not the same thing, you know, but that, that's one of the things that people like to criticize Eric for is like, well, you know, mucus is this, is like, no, he's talking, and he, he even talk, mentioned it, because he mentions lymph in passing, and since then, we, you know, they, uh, through the, the studies, they know more about, they know more about it, but they still don't really know a whole lot about it, they just kind of, they just recently learned of a new lymphatic operation or system in the head that was like you know in the past, well, like last year I think that uh, in a medical journal they were talking about that and so their understanding of lymphatic system is, is very uh, is, is, is fairly you know beginner uh, but uh, but yeah so that's I like to call it the mucus system so essentially the difference is you, you have uh, uh, two major fluids in the body you have blood and you have lymph fluid and you actually have more lymph in your body than blood but all we ever talk about is blood like well what about the lymph because the lymph is a sewer system that's the system in the body that is eliminating this waste and in the best situation you're going to be eliminating and filtering the waste through your lymphatic system and then through your kidneys you know it, fil it filters out that waste but if you're clogged up with a lot of toxic waste it's not going to make it to your kidneys. It might come out as a rash on your arm, or, or some pus coming out, you know, an ear sore, or you know, you know, any number of places on the body because we're so backed up. It's not, and, and a lot of our kidneys are weak. Um, we got to we got to repair our kidneys, and so yeah. So I mean, that's I guess I'm just talk, kind of talking about it there, but that's sort of usually what I talk about when I get into lymphatic. Yeah, well, yeah, well I've, yeah, I've been listening to Dr. Robert Morris lately. Um, yeah. You, you talk about the same thing. Yeah, he talks yeah. about the yeah. kidneys and the yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he he is. Uh, I look at Dr. Morris as, uh, he, you know, he he followed it. He's following in Eric's footsteps in uh, when it comes to the sanitarium tradition, where you know Eric had the sanitarium where he was healing thousands of bedridden people and, and incurable people and that kind of thing and that really inspired Dr. Morris and so for the past 40 years he's had his practice and worked with a lot of people uh, using some of it you know you know, really inspired by a lot of Eric's work but then he kind of brings in his theories uh, and his practices of 
the, the herbs in a certain way, you know. So, so I do, uh, 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 you know, I've studied a lot of Dr. Morris too, and, and he's, you know, he's, he's really the only other person that I kind of tell people to check out some of the things and the methodologies and the stuff he's doing. The thing with him where we're real different is he does not deal with transition, you know, and he really doesn't deal with lifestyle. He says, I don't care what your lifestyle is, but if you want to heal, you, you know, here's what you do, you know. And so he gets people into the fruit fasting and some uh, pretty, you know, aggressive herbs and that kind of stuff. Temporary fix. <laughs> well, two, two month long fruit. Basically, you just sort of stay on the protocol as long as you can. And, uh, and, and you can you know, step back and have a salad sometimes and stuff. He has that worked in there. But you basically stay on the program as long as you can until you heal. And a lot of people have healed. They've been perfectly fine with that. But the people that I work with that, have, that, that maybe have healed or, or maybe weren't were able to heal, they come to me and then I kind of tell them, well, you, you know, you, why don't you take a step back? and have some cooked mucus-free foods mm -hmm. because that's the one you know, real big difference between me and Dr. Morris. Uh, well, there's, there's a number of differences, but one of them is uh, that dynamic of I don't speak in a raw foodist dialectic where, it, you know, where, where a lot of raw foodists say the word cooked food, like where that's sort of the, the enemy for me, mucus forming foods is, is that, you know, so I prefer people to use the word mucus forming, you know, as being the, the bane of human existence because, you know, not all cooked food is made equally. Uh, it's a lot better to have some steamed collard greens with a salad, uh, you know, than it is to have some cooked pulled pork or something like that, you know, so that's kind of, uh, Talk about moving because again the lungs help pump the blood but there is no pump for the lymph system so when we eat foods you know all the, the mucus forming foods acid forming salty stuff all the processed foods we eat it slows down and in some <coughs> cases just totally stops the lymphatic system when we have our bodies and the lymph system backs up and it gets to the point where this, these waste and these acids are starting to impede on the nervous system. And if you get some acid on the wrong part of the nervous system, you know, you could be pain, it could, uh, you get it up in your brain and it can, you know, you go crazy, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, things along that line. Now, Eric even mentions that if you go on the mucus's diet long enough, the the, the, the little capillaries, you know, the little minuscule things that areas of the body that have, haven't even had blood yet. <laughs> that, you, you know, the, the, just these little capillaries and stuff will start to get that new blood because as you clean your blood, it starts to enrich your body and get deeper and deeper into your tissue systems, deeper into your body, and you are, uh, and, and essentially it starts to get into that. Yeah, so. Uh, so yeah, nervous system, when there's nervous system issues and uh, connected to lymphatic, it's just all because of that backup, you know, things that are just too, too backed up. Yeah, I, we call those, or um, I said we, I kind of did, uh, I call those ancillary therapies. So ancillary therapies are sort of anything that's not the diet, so you know, that's where you get into your, your massage therapy, your lymphatic massage, or your uh, you said the, the brushing, uh, sunbathing. I'm a huge proponent of sunbathing, and Eric has a whole section on it. A lot of people ignore that part. Uh, and, and, and no matter what's your color, you need to be out there in the sun and get as much sun as you can when it's warm enough. Because um, that in itself can, tra can, can tra transform your skin if you're out in the sun long enough and, and you and you Combine that with the diet, and you start walking around. People are like, oh, you know, your skin looking all uh, better, you know, and, and they'll be like, well, what, what do you, what moisturizer do you use? You know, what, what do you put on? Like, Sunday, and I eat mucus free foods and stuff, you know, juice and enemas, and it can change all that. But uh, yeah, so so those kind of things. I'm a there's there's a handful of things that I don't endorse. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't endorse. Uh, the urine drinking therapy. Oh, Y'all might be into that. Uh, I, I just that's one that's one example. 
<laughs> Some of y'all like I never even heard of nothing like it. Uh, so that's just just me personally. I, I don't you know I don't let people talk about that on on my forum because that's the opposite of what Eric was talking about. Eric was saying everything that leaves the body is totally waste. <laughs> There are some people that do this thing called urine therapy, so they, they drink their own, they fast on their own urine. Go ahead and do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna assume that they also eat some mucus forming foods too. I don't think they're they're, they're not mucus free uh, folks that are doing that. But um, so you know, so there's a, there's a few things like that that I uh, that uh, things that I would consider ancillaries that I don't. But yeah, the stuff, anything like, is natural. Is that, was that kind of like just stimulate stuff? You know, how well, and, you know, anything that you, you get things moving. You know, what Air talks about in a mucus's diet is, is uh, air baths. You know, or uh, if you, and you're, you know, ba you know uh, almost naked or whatever, but you, you know, kind of put the water on your skin, you're just opening the pores up. And, uh, and, it's just, and it's just that extra bit of breathing or just going out in, in the air and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. And so the thing is, we, we don't want to give the ancillary therapies too much emphasis. That's what I see sometimes where people get kind of obsessed with one particular, like, okay, this is going to be it, or I'm going to do this. It's like, that's, that, that's all good, you know, any, as long as it's not invasive and it's not too hardcore, uh, you know, exercise is, you know, is great, you know, and natural exercises is what I, I tend to promote. But, Okay, so I have a few staple items that I eat a lot of um, raw sprouted nuts and seeds and raw cacao that I love, and I just need to know are those mucus for me. Yeah, but they they can be used transitionally though. It's not so I, they're not they're not the kind of item that I would say like okay you really got to get off of that quick. It's like no, if you learn how to combine them in a way and you start. Getting you know upping your salads, and I don't know how you might already eat a lot of salads, but you you know upping the you know the raw fruits and vegetables, and and combining that, uh, you're gonna sort of keep that stuff moving a little quicker, you know. So something like the nuts, uh, and even if it's sprouted and, and seeds and that kind of thing, we recommend combining it with something like raisins, so dried fruit, because that that combination eliminates much better than if you just eat it by itself. Yeah. Well, dates. We we wouldn't necessarily. Uh, we wouldn't recommend. I mean, if, if 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 like that would be more like okay, I'm that tastes good kind of thing. But uh, is in terms of that actual elimination mechanism, that the, the dates doesn't work as well. It's not something we go to when we are. You know, Let's, let's go ahead and get ready for the break and eating. Yeah, like uh, a melon, you know, really should eat melon yeah, by itself. You know, that yeah. does not uh, uh, yeah, combine well with other items. So that's one thing that, to me, is a, it's it's just a really good principle. And it, it wasn't that hard for me to really get into that to just eat, you know, just kind of one type of fruit. And it's like, okay, good. And and a lot of my meals, uh, you know, overall mucus's diet. There's a lot of variations, and that's why it's hard to kind of, you know, to, to just put it all into one little, like, this is what you eat, uh, because it's different for each person based on where you're coming from, physiologically, it's based on what your parents ate, what you used to eat, you know, all these different factors come into play, you know, along with your cravings and that kind of thing. But what we want to do is move toward eating in a, in a better way. So an along with that is uh, we avoid drinking while we eat. So you, you eat first and then wait about 20 minutes and then you, you drink something if you want to drink something. I don't drink anything usually for hours or so. You know, I, do, I eat usually sometimes. Maybe a little water or something but not like a real if I'm going to have a real drink or something. Um, so what we're going to do today is uh, we're, we're going to uh, part of the methodology for the mucus diet is to you first eat fruit. If you're going to eat fruits and vegetables in the same meal, then you eat your fruit first. You wait about 15 to 20 minutes. Let the fruit kind of move through and, and digest a little bit. And then you have your vegetable meal. And when you have your vegetable meal, every vegetable meal should have a combination salad. So there should always be green leafy vegetables and maybe some kind of 
other uh, more firm vegetables, some kind of combination that will act as an intestinal broom. Mm -hmm. So, so look, look at how that's working. So you eat fruit and it goes in your body and it starts to loosen the waist up and uh, uh, yet it's, it's not totally eliminated or neutralized yet, it's just kind of loosened some things up. Then you come in behind it with the raw salad and it's going to start to kind of broom it out. Now, if you're at a higher level, you could just stick with the raw salad and that's it. If you're more transitioning, uh, then that's where you would bring in some cooked vegetables. So you eat a little bit of the raw salad first and then something, uh, some kind of cooked mucus-free vegetable like uh, uh, I think we're going to have today st steam zucchini or make the zucchini noodles and steam it or you know, I, when I was getting into the diet I did a lot of, uh, and you can do little, little onion sautés you know, and stuff to make it taste better if that's the level you're at. You know, at a higher level of the diet you leave that behind. But when you're, when you're wanting, especially when you want to fix something that, that you taste good to you, that it tastes good to everybody else, you know, you get into, you know, it's not, it's not these like harsh uh, kind of kind of rules like some folks get into. So, uh, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to let you guys go and get fruit first. So go uh, and have the fruit course, uh, the fruit portion of your meal, then we're going to wait about, you know, 10, 15 minutes, and then you can go and have the, uh, the vegetable part, you know, and I'll, I'll talk more about how to do that combination. And, uh, yeah, question? Yeah, what is your opinion on mushrooms? You can. I'm not a fan of them, yeah. Uh, they're yeah, fungus. They're fungus. Uh, I think they're slimy, yeah, they, you know, they're, I think they're fungus for me. I, I consider them. It's, that, that's kind of a hard one to really, uh, you know, to really test, but the... Uh, yeah, they, they just get slimy, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not a fan, and because we're trying to get away from fungus, you know, we're trying to get that, all that kind of stuff out of our body, and, and, and one way, and this is an interesting thing to think about, one way that we know that mushrooms are not natural for humans is if you take, take a bunch of children and take them to a table, and on one bowl, you have cherries and you have grapes and you have watermelon over here then over here you have raw mushrooms now how many kid, What which bowl you think the kids are going to go to are they going to go to the the bowl that has the fruit that has the cherries that has the watermelon or are they going to like want these mushrooms they go oh yeah these mushrooms they don't have that attraction most of them there's probably a couple kids that do but most <laughs> of the kids don't have an attraction to uh, uh, to, to mushrooms like that. We can look at a lot of foods like that. That's why kids don't like vegetables because we're, real, we're not fun, really fundamentally vegetable eaters. We have to eat them because what we've done to ourselves and where we are. But And that, again, that's, that's why people look at Eric and they think, oh, he's that radical fruit, fruitarian guy. I was like, no, he's not. He's, he's saying, yes, humans biologically are really fruit eaters. You know, biologically speaking, you look at our intestines, you look at our teeth and all that kind of stuff, we're much closer to our, as they call primate ants, you know, and that's a whole other subject to get into, but we're closer to other animals that we observe living on fruit, and so these big gorillas, what, where are you getting his protein from? All he's eating is bananas, and you know, you go out and find some of those, they're, they're doing pretty good. The strongest and biggest animals in the world are, are vegetarian eaters, not the carnivores. Um, so, but, but, the, but even kids aren't really attracted to vegetables. That's why we have to dress vegetables up a little bit lots of times. Because they don't taste good just by itself. But you don't, you don't have to dress up fruit, you know, when especially you start to clean up your, your taste buds and then you're starting to, you really taste in the intricacies of that. You don't even want nothing else. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Okay, you had us get the distilled lemon water and the bread, and how does that fit into our meal? So the uh, so what we'll do with the with the with the drink is I get like I, we'll kind of drink like in the second half. Of, so the drinking would be if if we stay unless you really want something because this is also you know it's not a total strict kind of thing. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. But if you want to follow the recommended plan, then what you, what you'll do first is is have a, get you some fruit. So we're going to have a fruit cor fruit meal. So the fruit part of the meal. 
And then, so don't worry about the liquid yet. Don't drink, you know, don't drink the liquid yet. Uh, we'll drink the liquid during the after we're done eating. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so the like the second half of the program, you can go and kind of get you some lemon water and that kind of thing. Um, Mm. Let's do it. It's boot camp. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now what we could do, some, a lot of times I'll, I'll drink a tall glass 30 minutes or so before, or an hour before my salad. Uh, of course. So <laughs> when you're trying to detox yourself or you're trying to be more aggressive with your transition, okay. you would stop there. You would you would have a meal that consists of just what you ate right now. Okay. Hey, 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 get up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so that so you, so you've experienced a, a piece of you know, and in the more more advanced levels, that is the meal. That is a, a an afternoon meal of fruit, the fruit meal, and then in the evening you would have the vegetable meal. And that's normally what I do most of the time. I have a fruit meal in the afternoon, and then I have a vegetable meal in the evening when I'm in that mode. There's sometimes I have two vegetable meals. There's been times where I've done what a lot of you will do today, where you have uh, a meal that incorporates both fruit and vegetables in the same meal, but you have to do it in the way that we're doing it today. So you had your fruit meal, and we, we've had you know about five minutes or you know five ten minutes to let that kind of go down first. So now we're going to have the vegetable portion, and what's involved in the vegetable portion is uh, raw salad. And so uh, the, yeah, you can go ahead and get all yeah get the vegetable piece rolling. That's right. And. Uh, Okay. And uh, where's the, uh, the toaster and the bread? No, the uh, the So, so what you want to do when you you, you can go ahead and get uh, uh, when you get your salad and your steamed vegetables. If you're raw, you don't have to. Get the steamed vegetables. Leave that off and just have the raw salad. That's fine. Uh, if you want sort of the you know the whole thing, have the raw salad and get some of the steamed vegetables. I think that they're in some sauce. We had talked about having the sauce separate. So if you didn't want the sauce or you just wanted to have uh, or put a little bit of sauce on it, you could. But it's okay that it's it's there because sometimes. There's been times where I've used a lot of sauce. So, using a lot of tomato sauce uh, with vegetables helped me get off of, actually helped me get off of meat in, really uh, in the early days because it was, I liked it so much it was filling and so I wasn't missing the meat. So that's important if you're trying to get off of that kind of stuff is, uh, you know, I'm not a big person that, that preaches like restriction in terms of like, like uh, you know, amounts. I'd rather see somebody eat a lot of mucus free food um, not just to overdo it, but but to have a nice amount that's gonna you know make you feel satiated and satisfied, than to have you know little bits of like pus forming foods with some, you know, some people try to do. So what we're gonna do? Get you get you your salad. Get you uh, if you're gonna have some of the, the cooked vegetables, you put that in on the side or however you wanna you know in a separate. I don't know if there's little bowls or cup or you know but you can get that. And you want to start with eating the, the raw salad first uh, that's on your plate. So, you know, eat, eat, eat at least several bites of the raw salad first before you start to eat some of the cooked stuff. Uh, ideally, you would eat about a quarter of the raw salad before you entered in any cooked foods. And that's what I'm talking about methodologically competent, you know, very, you know, different from just sort of like, okay, these are the foods I need to eat. It's like, no, it's very specific. And if you notice what we're doing is we're going from best to worst in terms of what we're eating in the transition on, on a micro scale, you know, on a small, on, a, on the context of a meal. So you have your fruit, which is the best, mono fruit meal. Then you, you have the raw salad, that's, that's good, and then you throw in the cooked vegetables that are mucus free, and so that's okay, well that's not on the same level as raw salad, but we're good. You know, and then, finally, if you're still uh, craving, if you're at the beginning of your transition, this is for you, uh, we have 100% grain bread, some kind of grain bread, uh, the, the, the sprouted wheat, Ezekiel bread, 
And once you've eaten all of your salad, if you're still craving uh, something, you're not satisfied yet, or you're still craving a little mucus, go and uh, toast, toast, uh, toast some of that bread, and uh, you'll get you like one, you know, one piece or two pieces of the bread. Toast it really good. And what are we doing when we toast it? We are toasting out the gluey properties. So I would never, I would never tell somebody to just go eat some bread without first toasting it. And so that, and, and you'll notice in the Mucus's Diet book, Eric continually brings that up about like, you know, it, it specifically said, it really emphasizes that toast as something to use when you have a craving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The green apple, the red apple, tell us. Huh? The green apple, green, apple green. And green and versus The difference red. between green and red apple. Mm -hmm. They the, the they look different. <laughs> I, mean, I, know, I know what you I know what you're getting at, but that that's part of what we don't you know we our thing is does this turn into slime? When I eat this, is this going to flush my system? Is the distilled water in this gonna you know serve to flush my care. system and and go through, or is it gonna turn into slime in my intestines? This will not turn into slime in my intestines. You know, and so we, you know, we don't get uh, in the mucus diet healing system. We don't get into a lot of the, like the hybrid theories as a concern, as something to kind of be real concerned about in terms of like the fruit and the vegetables. It's like just eat the fruit, just eat whatever it is, because I don't know anything that's not hybrid, because I don't know anything that's the original fruit from two million years ago on the earth it's it's everything's evolving and changing and yeah there's things that are totally man kind of man spliced made and messed with it and stuff but our question is always first and foremost is a mucus form is it going to turn into slime in the body and if it's not then it is a candidate for food item <laughs> Um, okay, you mentioned about uh, blending uh, the vegetables, like um, if that's a that's a method of processing or changing the food. So you don't really recommend like smoothies or things like that, then, right? And, um, what, and what about also? I'm sorry, this is like a two-part question. What about like like butter, like almond butter or peanut butter? Or which is kind of a blended nut, I guess. Yeah, so I think that there is some peanut butter over here. Eric recommends if, if you want to have some, some kind of nut butter on your toast, again, because it's a transitional item, it's mucus forming, but, you know, throw it on there. Because uh, I, I was using, which a lot of people don't, I don't even really recommend to people, but I use, like, the soy butter and all that kind of stuff because I was trying to get off of, like, real butter and, you know, just as bad as I ate. So that was a step up for me. But um, uh, so the way that we kind of deal with some of those things is it, when you let go and you let your body transform and go down this road, your body is going to tell you when you cannot have that kind of stuff no more. Right. You know, because I, I could only do the the, the, the the peanut butter on toast thing for maybe a year. And and I, and I went to eat it one time and tore my stomach up and I was like, well, that's that's over. You know, that's, that's over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, do you recommend nuts? Uh, combined with raisins, yeah. Uh, not never by itself. Nuts combined with raisins or uh, your know, black mission figs. But the best situation is raisins, and, uh, and and don't eat it. Don't eat no nuts anywhere near liquid. Uh, anywhere you know, no juicy fruit near the nuts uh, because it's hard for it to really digest. Mm -hmm. And you get cleaner. It, it, you become much more sensitive to those kind of issues of, of digestion. Well, I know you say you're alternate, but if you take your nuts and you make nut butter, I'm talking about just doing your own nuts at home. Uh, do you recommend that? Isn't that more like pre-digested? I mean, it, it, it just you by yourself, or would you be putting it on something? Oh, no, I'm talking about whether than... Are nuts a part of it? Is that what you well, nuts, and, and nuts, this nuts. sort of gets or back around to the blended. You know, I don't say don't ever blend, but I'm not a fan of that daily blending thing that has caught on among some people. Where and the reason is, and Eric talks about uh, there's uh, he's not a big fan of, of soup, and the reason is because when you mix liquid with the vegetables in the same thing, 
it just confuses your digestive system. And, and, and again, if you're eating a normal diet, you know, the kind of the standard American diet, you're not going to be sensitive enough to even really feel that. You start cleaning yourself up and you notice like, oh, that didn't feel good because the liquid does not mix well with the solid food. And with, a, with, with the uh, blended, I prefer juicing. And so I went for years juicing every day, you know, uh, doing uh, mostly fruit juices, uric acid types, which I know a lot of weird. I'm just continuing the conversation from earlier. We'll talk about that a little bit. But people that have a really acidic constitution, uh, I recommend that they drink a lot of vegetable juices, you know, fresh vegetable juices, uh, because that will neutralize a lot of that acid. Uh, so, so juicing, I'm, I'm for. I, I blend things maybe two or three times a year. I'll I'll have I'll splurge and have a smoothie or something, you know, and just whatever, you know. Just so it's not like it's forbidden and I would never do it. It's just uh, I'm not a fan of like some of that Vitamix story. They're kind of trying to do it every day. The reason is because it, it doesn't it doesn't really digest, and it's like you, you have all this pulp and this sort of thickness that's there and it's kind of going in and just kind of sits there if it, if it was just the raw vegetables which I would recommend well just eat the raw vegetables that's giving your intestines something to work on because they're sure like okay they, yeah 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 you're, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you're that, processing yeah. it and stuff it's, it's yes yeah. and then with juices the juices don't leave anything behind you know if you if your juice is, is you know you got a decent juicer you're not going to have a bunch of grit or stuff so it's just going to be filtered through your kidneys with uh, with a small amount of sediment, yeah. So, so that's kind of the, the reasoning Thank there. You. Um, <laughs> can I can I say something about the nuts and the smoothie? Yeah. Um, now that I hardly do smoothies either, when I do it, I do notice it. Most most of us have ballooning in our intestinal tract because we've just stretched it out so much <laughs> with seven. So I notice the smoothie sitting. Some, you know, I could be jumping up like a kid. You can feel it. You can feel it. Yeah. Or I'm yeah. laying down. Oh my I can feel it just sitting and trying, it ain't going nowhere. It's trying, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So it, I, so that kind of did it for me because I used to make smoothies every day. Mm -hmm. um, and then with respect to the nuts, is that, isn't that something you, you, you transition eventually? All, all fats are mucus forming. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And, and that's. Yeah. When I did the nuts, I've soaked them mm. like a couple of hours so they digest easier. So how do you feel about that? Transitioning, soaking the nuts. Yeah, I mean transitionally if, if you if if you like it like that, you know, it's not okay. something that I necessarily recommend that at all. In, okay. You know, in general I've I've never recommended that much because to me it's it's sort of when, you, when you're in that realm, just do whatever you want to do. You know, if, if you're going to eat the nuts and the seeds, you know, make, in, instead of trying to use, the, and, and unless that, you want to make that part of your transition where you're, you're trying to incrementally make that part of it better. For me, it's just kind of like, all right, this is what it is, and then when, when it's gone, it's gone. You know, like I'm not going to try to, it, for a, a better example of what I'm talking about there is, I didn't, I didn't transition off of pizza by saying, okay, I'm going to get rid of the meat. I'm going to, I'm, I'm first to transition. I'm going to get rid of the meat and just have cheese. And then I'm going to get rid of the cheese and have just vegetables. It was either all or nothing with that, with that particular kind of food. So certain foods, you, you don't want to slow transition you know, off of like, <laughs> Like, right. Like maybe Next. this is, and so, so you know, so the the you know, obviously the pizza is the worst example, but that's kind of how I feel about it like that. Like if you like it, if it's better, and you want to soak it, you know, cool. But yeah, you, know, you know, I don't want to you know stay there too long anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. So uh, you know, earlier you were saying that you had been on uh, this type of diet, this type of lifestyle for about 14 years. How did you still? How do you still maintain your muscle mass? Mm. <laughs> I know, I mean, but that's the thing, we, we, there's not enough people that have really done what they, you know, done this to see how it, you know, that see, see how it works, and so I didn't, I was never really concerned about that, you know, and I still work out, I don't, 
you know, I, I don't have, you know, that I used to have 18 inch biceps and, you know, bench press 300 pounds. I don't do that anymore. Cause if, if, I, if I wanted to, I probably actually think I could because I know technique. I can go in the weight room and just do a bunch of weight because I know because I got technique. But uh, I just I just didn't believe in this concept that if we don't eat enough of whatever that we're going to, you know, fall apart or, you know, and that kind of thing. So what I've noticed is with me, is I, I pick up weight real easy and it, when I'm eating vegetables, like if I'm in a period where I'm eating a lot of vegetables, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll am i be bigger than a lot of people that just don't eat anything. And I don't even have to eat that much of it, you know, and, and I keep, you know, my weight. And that's just my physiology, you know. There's other people that, that couldn't, they eat what I eat and they would, you know, they would kind of, <laughs> but, we, but one thing with the mucus diet is we, we in general don't, think much about weight. weight. You know, we don't really obsess about that and worry about that. We observe it. It's mm -hmm. something interesting to look at. And it's interesting, but it's not something that, you know, that we're like really, uh, really into. I want, I want mm -hmm. to answer that by saying too that I think a big part of why people lose weight, especially at first, when they're kind of fast, is because they still have parasites that are taking away well, uh, some of their vital energies and nutrients and even eating away at some of their tissues. Mm -hmm. So but once you get rid of the parasites, then you can your weight will stabilize again and they won't be draining you from your um, energy. Because that's what a breatharian that I um, if you YouTube Atlantis Rising, she's a breatharian and she talks about that. Yeah, I think there's even a yeah I mean, there there is a yeah there's a level where when breathing you can put on weight breathing. You know, if you're doing uh, you know breath exercises, you know, and, and, and you're kind of filling out. Um, yeah. So there. And, and so that's. I mean, that's an area of research that we all have to do together. I mean, we're. It's like we're at the embryo stages of this, and that's what I'm saying. That this is the cutting edge of physiological science. You want to use word science? Just physiological understanding. This is the revolution. This is the direction it has to go, and we're just starting. Like, just don't, you, know, you know, we're not saying, "Oh man, this is all." It's like, look, like we're we're all in this together because we can. We we we're like the the founding mothers and fathers of the next human species. You know, like the next potential. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Have you ever um, drank aloe vera juice? And so you think about aloe vera? I, I, I never got into that. Uh, I, I don't like it when people s start to try to rely on that, like as a, as a, uh, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a staple? Like a, no, like a, la some a people use that like a laxative. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah, like a flush. Yeah, so I don't like, you know, that, and sometimes, you know, if, if the, the enemas, I use those in a certain way, you know, if, if there's someone that is not having natural bowel movements, then I say, okay, well, wait. Hold up on the anima for a minute and have the natural bowel movement, then do the anima. You know, in some cases, uh, if it's the beginning of somebody's transition, I might still I might have them doing the animas anyway. Uh, you know, so there's uh, all these things are person specific. You know, there's never like one rule for everybody. And, uh, so okay, so what we got going on? So if you want the vegetable course, then go ahead and go get you the salad. Uh, the salad we got. Uh, some steamed vegetables in some sauce. Uh, it's a fried parsley in if you want. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not the hugest fan of, uh, of cayenne pepper, but I, I never was someone that, you know, that, that wants that real hot spicy thing anyway, you know, so, because uh, I guess if along the line something that I tell people to kind of stay away from would be like the really hot peppers and that kind of stuff. There's some people that would say, oh, well, these hot peppers, uh, it, it loosened up mucus. It's like, well, I mean, at the it it sort of you think it did, but I think what I think what happened is it complicated and kind of irritated the mucosa to a point where it stirred up waste. Because uh, there's a difference between it's kind of irritating the mucosa, which is what like the poisons do, versus having the astringent property like the fruits have, where they pull on the mucosa and kind of cause it to secrete and eliminate the lymph, you know, so it's a different different dynamic. But uh but yeah, the real hot kind of pepper and stuff. I'm not a big fan of pepper, I don't really put pepper, you know, put a lot of pepper and stuff. But you but the yeah the seasonings are
kind of the area where that's that's to your specific taste. Explore, have fun, you know, kind of find what tastes good. What what blew my mind was when uh, Brother Air, as I, I learned how to cook for myself on the Mucus's diet, as I was going over to Brother Air's house and he, his whole family practiced Mucus's diet. His wife, and he was had a, uh, at the time, and I met him was like a seven year old son, and you know, and so. He taught me how to cook uh, within the context of Mucus's diet, and I I didn't really cook growing up because I, I mostly ate out all the time. Like I would eat out sometimes three times a day, uh, so I didn't have a lot of bad habits to, to break in terms of cooking. So I kind of learned from Brother Aaron just right. You know, so that that if anything, you know, that kind of worked out. But uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I learned from watching him and. Something as simple as like the onion saute, uh, a little bit of olive oil, you put, put in some onions or some garlic and you put in some green peppers or whatever, you make that saute and you throw some steamed vegetables in there, I mean you're full, like you ain't missing anything, you know, you're not, it's like, hey, that was good, you know, um, and so, and it was a couple times I went into his house and I was like, and this was real early in the diet, and I was smelling, I was like, it smells like there's meat in here. You can cook the meat? And he's like, no, nah, man, that's just the onions. But what I realized was, we don't even really, we don't really like the meat. That's right. We, we like the seasonings. Right, right. Because the seasonings, that's the taste, that's, the, that's that sweetness and that, you know, that, that, that flavor. Uh, so you take, you can take the meat out of it and season vegetables and that kind of thing and be like, oh, wait a minute, that's what I really liked about the item. Eggplant. Uh, and, yeah, eggplant, yeah, you bake, bake the eggplant. But that's, uh, a, that's the nightshade. See, but me would be hard when you just drop it in some more water. water. Nightshade is poison. Well, we, yeah, but that's where we, uh, another one where we kind of, we disagree on that as far as uh, it, 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 Depends. It depends on the physiology. So if you're if you're at a high level physiologically, then so, yeah, so, uh, some, some onions or some other nightshade kind of things is gonna uh, or cruciferous vegetables that you know different stuff like that is gonna irritate you and, and be sort of poison. Yeah, uh, it, this is all about different levels. Of, you know, so at a certain level. That salad would be poison, you know, and uh, you know if you're on a real high kind of like fruit level, you know, and so that's why we use all these things transitionally, and at a certain point, once you know the principles, you just let your body kind of lead you along the way and dictate because it's because it's gonna definitely tell you when you eat something that that you're not like oh wait a minute I can't eat that no more. I mean I had that experience with uh, with cabbage because in the early days. I was steaming a lot of cabbage. I had no problems with it. I was putting it in with the, with the onion saute and the raw salad and it was cool. And then all of a sudden, it just started creating so much pain and gas, it wasn't eliminating no more. And I, I switched from cabbage to collard greens. You know, and then that, and I was doing the collard greens for years. And now I'm getting to the point where like, the, you know, like ah, the collard greens is, is going, you know. Yeah. And I'm she down. made a salad, we went to Mount Shasta, and she made a salad, a bag salad. We were eating straight raw. Um, because when we went, people are vegan. And um, so, preparation was already, we were already on that page. It was kale, tomatoes. Um, and cucumbers. Mm -hmm. Well, and she she did this combo salad and lemon juice. And um, I did fine eating it, but by the time I got to Shasta, by the time night fell, I almost died. Really? I almost died. Really almost I really and truthfully almost I'm sorry. died from that. Yeah. 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 And um, what happened was gas was trapped, and it was so severe that my stomach—I looked like I was about six months pregnant. Yeah. yeah. And um, we were just listening to your lecture about having these systems clogged up, right? Mm -hmm. And I found—I knew I was clean. Yeah. Haha. <laughs> And then she made the salad, and by the time we got to Shasta, I she actually had to do deep tissue massage in order for me to make it that evening wow. yeah. to the next day. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was raw. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Wasn't no cooked food jumping off. 
Yeah. We just and that's straight and, wrong. And that's one thing Eric mentions in the book because he addresses that. The same issues that we, we're dealing with with the raw thing today. He was, it was happening back then, and, and, and you know where there was sort of he called it raw food fattest. Okay. That were so obsessed with getting off of cooked food that they ignored the whole mucus, which they didn't know yet because he was coming up with it. But they uh, did not realize that cooked mucus-free foods would be way better. Here it was I used the term the term some of the terminology from addiction studies over the years and applied it to mucus eating, you know, mucus forming foods and uh, to put into perspective how tough this process is, how addicted we are to mucus forming foods and how we have to treat it as if it is a serious addiction because uh, Uh, you know, because like all addictions, usually they have some kind of negative consequence. Mm -hmm. And when the majority of people, majority of people in the world die from pus and mucus poisoning. Mm -hmm. Heart attack, pus and mucus poisoning. Uh, stroke, pus and mucus poisoning. Uh, the C word, pus and mucus poisoning. Uh, the colon, uh, yeah, C colon C word. Uh, you know, all these things that are like the top ten ways that people die uh, is, is, is mucus poisoning. So I would say that it then would qualify as being called an addiction because it's something that's very negative to the body. It's just been so normalized that we don't even see it like that. So they, in, in, in the classical addiction studies, they have like stages of addiction and they have many models and theories about addiction exist and uh, the program draws upon the, the classic models uh, uh, an overpowering desire or need or compulsion to continue eating pus and mucus by any means necessary. <laughs> a tendency to increase the amount over time. And, and, and we see this. Look at how they transition right along with this. It's supply and demand. They, uh, what a small fry isn't good enough, now we need super size. Yes. What one patty isn't enough, we need two, we need three, we need four. So it's it's doing that. So it's it, it, again getting normalizing more and more of this of these foods. Uh, a, a psychic or psychological and generally a physical dependence on the effects of pus and mucus. Uh, and for de detrimental effects on the individual uh, and on society. Uh, and they. Uh, okay, and, I, and, the, and I, I drew all, all of this came from the uh, uh, sort of an old model of addiction that they would apply to heroin and cocaine and that kind of thing. And I just replaced the word heroin or just that item with mucus. Wow. And it fits. Wow. <laughs> it's real, you know. wow. And the body develops its tolerance. What I really want to get to would be... Uh, triggers. So triggers anything that sparks an emotional response and addicts that in turn lead them to a thought that their uh, substance of choice will calm them. You know, so some kind, some kind of trigger, and uh, probably one of the number one triggers is is what <laughs> for mucus uh, mucus's diet. Sugar. Well, it's, it's interesting getting the, getting the so different opinions. <laughs> 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 So from what I've seen, the, and this is this is subjective. Huh? No. For me, it's social. Social. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. I've been at my issue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I've seen that the number one now. Yeah, stress, but but stress often comes out of a social dynamic, some kind of social. Most people aren't stressed kind of by themselves of this. It's like other people doing something to them or a job situation, which usually has to do with other people and money, which still has to do with with sort of a societal thing, a social thing. Uh, but to me, yeah, it all kind of comes back to social and. 
again, that's why I said I stopped eating in restaurants because it was a crazy trigger for me. I could I could go to a restaurant with the best intentions, mm -hmm. be like, okay, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna just get a salad and sit here <laughs> and be cool, and then before I know it, I'm I'm like, oh, I'm just finding whatever kind of weird stuff that, that, that they could find me that I would rationalize eating, you know. And so for me, I just had to cut out that trigger uh, until. Mm -hmm. You know, until it was no no longer a trigger, but I still still don't eat out. I don't know if I say that, but um, let's see. Uh, Yo, yeah, so relapse to fall or slide back into a former state after a period of improved conditions or behaviors. Uh, major pus and or mucus relapse triggers wrong social environments and circumstances, especially those that remind you of your old habitual habits. Uh, media depictions of pus and mucus eating. Look at what they're doing. You, you drive drive down the street and there's you know a you know, half naked woman eating some big hearts, you know some some kind of thing like this or some you know, drinking the beer or what you know whatever it is. They they just glorifying the pus and the mucus. Every all these commercials. Uh, <laughs> You know, because uh, I don't watch you know, regular television, I can deal with my stuff on YouTube and, and basically <laughs> on demand what I want to watch. You know, I want right, to watch documentaries right, and educational right. things. But uh, at the hotel, I was watching. Every once in a while, I like to watch a period of TV to study it because I analyze it. Yeah, and see. And, see and, and I always like to analyze uh, advertisements. You know, because it. it it's just interesting because it's so steeped in psychology and they understand you know just how to people's minds are working to manipulate them and stuff and uh, and, the, and so I'm always kind of analyzing the one thing that I noticed when they're trying to sell pus and mucus forming foods it's 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 usually silly and crazy like they it's always something stupid going on it's like because uh, was when the last time you saw somebody sell vegetables like that like the way they would sell you know s some little character or some little cartoon right. you know really like, hey, 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 this. like you don't see that like a distraction yeah they sell it to kids like it's on like fruit and vegetables just for kids that's it right and but but and, but the th and the thing is they they are the a lot of the commercials that are geared toward adults that are based on selling pus and mucus forming foods. It's like they're, they're using the same psychology as when they sell to kids. To, you know, because it's like the, the, the commercials are so juvenile and so, you know, adolescent. The sex with the naked lady and all that. Yeah, yeah, and they're all, yeah, all the uh, subliminal messages and all that kind of stuff, but it's like, the the sad thing is they don't even have to they don't even have to work that hard <laughs> selling uh, you know and this is getting a little bit into that you know what other what other triggers can you come up with we kind of just did that drunk that becomes everybody's friend that's in the room but they normally wouldn't be able to be that social there's uh, the person that gets drunk and wants to go to sleep. There's the person that gets drunk and wants to go have sex. You know, there's all Why? these different types, of, and it goes the same with all these different drugs. I, you know, growing up, I, you know, I, I did drug, you know, growing up, and I smoked the weed, and I did. I was all in there, doing that whole, that whole lifestyle, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, and and of course, I was my thing was smoking was like like the the the, the mellow type of smoker, but I didn't realize until even not that long ago, some people smoke weed and they, they, they kind of, it's like an upper for them. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. you know, and, and there was a whole group of people that were, that were like weed uppers. I was like, because <laughs> they're, they're not even, you're not, me like, you know, they're not mellow. Right. Yeah, not <laughs> and, uh, and so, so that's interesting in each body and it's the same for Plus, if you're just forming food, some people eat a steak and they go get tired and go fall asleep. Some people eat a steak and they want to go play some football. Uh, so, uh, some people eat a steak and they go rape somebody. Mm -hmm. Some people yeah. eat a steak and they go eat uh, and they go they go beat down a brother or sister. And they go shoot somebody. Uh, or, you know, what do you th what do you think these people are eating that that go and, and do these mass shootings? Not fruit, not nothing but fruit. <laughs> They're not you just free. <laughs> and so, mm. yeah, so that that's something 
that we got to you know really look at. And some of those things you you can't really like that's gonna that's gonna seem extreme to you until you get into the mucus's diet long enough. And again, like I said earlier, your whole vision of the world changes to such an extent that you're like, wow, you know, recently I came up with this idea that mucus's diet is the empathy diet. It's, it can and almost scientifically always does transforms someone's uh, created a, a society of people that if, if if psychopathic tendencies are a spectrum, then we got the society that the spectrum's over here. So they might love their mother and, and father, and and this would explain what is unexplained. So how could somebody love a mother and you know their mother and father and their children and a, and a dog? Yet they go up and, and, and they lynch it. They they're bringing their children to lynchings with some brothers and sisters on. You know, be, being hung up in a tree, and, and you see those pictures where they got the little kid. You know, like the little kids are like playing hopscotch and stuff. And there's this commute. Why? Why isn't it total psycho psychopathy? You know, why? How can they love within this little circle and hate so viciously outside of it? Pus and mucus. Because what I've seen is almost scientifically, you clean yourself up and you go down this path. Your mentality totally changes, yeah. totally shifts, and you yeah. become...